Spoiler warning. Ten Candles is a game with various surprises for first-time players, many of which are discussed during the course of this video. If you don't want to be spoiled, turn back now. Is this working? I'm, I'm not sure if anyone will see this, but I, I figured that if there was a chance, I should give it a shot. It was, oh gosh, ten days ago now? There's a camera here, a few lights that seem to be working, but if nothing else, there are lights, which means for the moment I'm safe. But I'm guessing they won't last long. They never do. My name is Jen Kretschmer. Before all of this, I worked in TV and in games. But that was before the sun went out. Before we lost touch with the satellites. And before they came. If you're watching this, I need you to know a few things. You need to keep moving. Staying put won't protect you. Bring a handful of friends. They will be your best chance at getting through it. Remember who you are. Always know where there's light. They won't come near the light. It's the only place you'll be safe. And hold on to hope. Even when it seems like everything is lost, hope might keep you alive. These things are true. The world is dark. And we are alive. Back in 2017, my cousin messaged me, saw this at a small indie game convention out here. It looked super cool and you can adapt the framework to a lot of different scenarios, along with a link to a publisher I had never heard of before. I clicked it, grabbed the PDF for $10 and started to read. Within minutes, I had ordered a hard copy and my jaw was on the floor. It was one of the most extraordinary pieces of game design I had ever seen. Within days of the hard copy arriving, I had run the game twice, bought a new voice recorder exclusively because it wouldn't shine much extra light if used mid-game, and was rethinking everything I thought I knew about tabletop storytelling. The game? Ten Candles, published by Cavalry Games. In less than a hundred pages, its creator, Stephen Dewey, designed one of the most elegant, effective, and narratively satisfying systems that I have ever seen. The absolute worst game of Ten Candles that I've ever played was merely great. The best will live as one of the most extraordinary storytelling experiences I've ever encountered in any medium. So, Let's talk about what Ten Candles is. Ten Candles is a collaborative, cooperative tabletop role-playing game for three to six players and a GM. Unlike games like D&D, which may have story arcs or campaigns drawn out over many sessions, each session of Ten Candles is a completely unique, self-contained story. Over the course of two to four hours, with little to no advanced preparation, the players create and embody characters fighting to endure in a recently invaded world. Facing off with scarce resources, obstacles, and enemies, the PCs must strive with all that they have to survive. Let me be clear about something. They won't. You see, Ten Candles is a game of tragic horror, and you go in fully aware that by the time the last candle goes out, your character will be dead. But the story and the magic of the game comes out of finding the ways that you try to live. Part of what makes Ten Candles so brilliant is the freedom that players, particularly seasoned RPG players, find in the knowledge that no matter what you do, you won't survive your final contact with the enemy. Ordinarily, you'd expect that the knowledge that there is no winning would cause players to feel defeated to check out. But because everyone enters the story with a full awareness of where we're headed, you're left with only one choice. To live. The entire focus of the game becomes not about strategy, mechanical synergies, or tactical victories, but rather about the relationships between the characters, the, the choices we make in times of great desperation, and what we do with the time we have. Ten Candles is self-limited. The game only lasts until the final candle has been extinguished. It's a system that is endlessly replayable and extraordinarily flexible, but each individual story is designed to take place in one two to four hour sitting. By the end of that session, the candles will be out, the character traits will have burned, and the characters will be lost. It is cooperative. There's a GM, but players carry just as much of the story narratively. The GM controls the world and the enemies, but the players have a hand in designing them. The players compete with the GM to determine what is behind a door or how a moment resolves, what they find in the shadowy bunker. The entire table works together to tell the best story possible. To play, you need a collection of D6s, 
in two styles, more on that in a moment, a stack of index cards, some pens, a lighter, a voice recorder of some kind. I highly recommend that you get one which gives off as little light as possible, but you can absolutely use anything from voice memos on your phone to a tape recorder. A fireproof bowl, because yes, you will be burning things. And of course, the eponymous 10 tea light candles. The game begins with a character creation process. Now, there are some twists and turns to the process later that I'll get into, but for the moment, let's stick to the basics. Not only are the players and GM creating their characters, but the table is also creating what the game calls them with a capital T, the invaders that are unique to the game session. The players have a hand in developing them, their strengths, their abilities, their secrets. They are born of your table's collective imagination. To start, everyone takes a stack of index cards and writes down two traits. A virtue, a personality trait which helps your character in their life. Compassionate, witty, academic, connected. Uh, and then a vice, an aspect of their character which creates problems, reckless, terrified, mercurial, vengeful. Your GM now introduces the setting where the story will take place and sets the tone with a brief description and a goal. You can use one of the included modules, which are open-ended enough that they are practically endlessly replayable, or you can create your own. The setting can be anything from a 1980s style summer camp perfect for a slasher story to a derelict spaceship to an abandoned city. Once you know a little bit about your setting, you can flesh out your character a bit more. Their name, what they look like, and some general sort of concept, an archetype, an occupation, that sort of thing. Your character should easily be described in a couple of sentences and should absolutely fit, again, on an index card. Next, everyone builds out a moment, a situation which, if encountered, provides a brief respite in the dark, a personal way that your character finds hope. In fact, a moment always begins with the words, I will find hope. I will find hope when I hold a picture of my family again. I will find hope in a game of checkers. I will find hope in a warm bowl of soup. I will find hope in a song around a fire. You also create a brink a secret trait that describes what happens when a character is pushed to their limit. You don't create your own brink, but rather you create a brink for the person to your left. If that person happens to be the GM, you are creating an essential element of your game's them. If you are the GM, they have seen the player to your left do something awful and are going to do everything they can to push them back to it. Brinks always begin, I have seen you. I have seen you betray your partner. You left them alone, taking their blade. I have seen you lie. You had an extra can of food you just weren't willing to share. I have seen you hesitate. When we heard the rustling in the bushes, you couldn't draw your weapon. We're lucky it was just a dog. You pass your brink to its rightful owner. Your brink is your last resource. You can only use it when everything else is gone. So you now have a virtue, a vice, a moment, and a brink. When you use a trait, you burn it, destroying a piece of your character and pushing them closer to their brink, that treacherous secret truth of what might happen when they're pushed over the edge. Ten Candles is a game that frequently feels like a ritual. Candles are lit and extinguished in a particular sequence, beginning with specific moments during character creation, giving a ceremonial feel to the game as a whole. A game session usually encompasses ten scenes, and the close of each scene is marked by snuffing out a candle. As the darkness and whatever is hiding within it creeps closer to both the characters and the players, the GM speaks the phrase, these things are true, the world is dark. Each person then has the chance to create an absolute truth of the world, one truth per lit candle proceeding around the table. These truths can be about anything. I have a flashlight in the trunk of my car. The door is unlocked. The radio picks up a signal. The road on the north side of town has completely vanished. Though only the GM may create truths about them or the darkness pressing ever closer. Once a truth is spoken aloud, it is incontrovertible. The final truth is spoken by the entire table, and we are alive. This pattern proceeds throughout play, establishing one fewer truth each cycle until no lit candles remain. One of the most unique elements of Ten Candles is the function of the dice pools. 
At their core, roles determine who narrates what happens next, regardless of whether an outcome is good or bad. Though a player may win narrative rights, it may be at a dire cost if it serves the story. Failure and success have their place, but how a story is told is the crux of the matter for Ten Candles. Each scene, the GM has a number of dice representing the extinguished candles, while the players have a collective pool representing the lit candles. When the players come across a situation that has a reasonable chance of failure or an unknown outcome, the GM may call for a conflict role. For example, a player might start digging through the filing cabinets at the office building where the party is holed up, hoping to find something that could point them toward the lab where they've heard that an antidote is being held. As they tear into the files, the GM could choose to call for a conflict roll. The player who is navigating that conflict will roll the collective dice pool. Any rolls of six indicate success. If no six is rolled in the pool, the conflict is failed, and any dice with rolls of one are removed from the pool until the end of the scene, when the candle is extinguished, making it progressively riskier for players to take on challenges. Whenever players make their rolls, the GM also makes a roll using their own dice pool. If the GM rolls more sixes than the player, they win the right to describe how the subsequent failure occurs. Failed player rolls end the scene and snuff out the candle. The communal dice pool is then refilled, and dice are transferred to the GM's dice pool based on any candles that have been extinguished, including candles prematurely or accidentally snuffed out. Each die that transfers from the players to the GM increases the likelihood that the GM will win narrative rights, accelerating the pace at which the darkness and the ultimate demise of the characters closes in. Coming into Ten Candles from D&D and other combat-oriented TTRPGs, this approach to winning and losing was an absolute revelation for me. I fully expected that whenever players would win narrative rights, they would describe things that they thought would help them win, that would drive them towards success by a more traditional metric. Instead, I was shocked to find that both when establishing truths and narrating results, even successes, players would often intentionally place obstacles or conflicts, frequently far more complex or gut-wrenching than I would have created for them in their own path. I learned just how much of the narrative heavy lifting I can give to players and how much they will gladly take on. It's a lesson that I have found to be immensely valuable to me in every game that I have played since, whether it was for D&D &D or indie games which relied on other unique non-dice mechanics. Players, when given the opportunity, will invest in the narratives and give themselves far more meaningful, monstrous consequences that matter to their PCs than the DM ever could. These mechanics, the ritualized truths, the slow migration of dice, and thus the narrative advantage to the GM's pool is where Ten Candles' brilliant, economical design really begins to shine. The structure means that scenes naturally begin to progress much more quickly, with scenes closer to the end often ending much faster than earlier scenes. A first or second scene may take an hour. Players are introducing themselves, making a plan, winning most of their dice rolls. But by the time you hit scene seven or eight, they are around every corner. Each move is risky, characters are close to their brink, and the dice are heavily stacked against the PCs. The darkness is creeping in on every side, and the inevitability of their fate is pushing the characters to desperate measures. By the time the GM and group speak the phrase, these things are true, the world is dark, and we are alive, for the last time, it is by the light of one small flickering flame. The GM has near total control, and they will be victorious. But you still have choices to make. How will your character leave the world? With cowardice? Taking out as many of them as possible with your final action? What will you leave behind? And this is the moment that has the most extraordinary responses I've ever encountered at a gaming table. Immediately after character creation, each player records a farewell message as their character. This could be a letter, a voicemail, a random statement to the world. Something telling anyone who might survive that they were here. That they knew that things looked bad and they gave it a shot regardless. By the point in the game where the last candle is extinguished and the gaming group is in complete darkness, several hours have elapsed. Most players, especially new players, have forgotten about the recording, which tends often to be laughing, halting, unsure, in the voice of a brand new person who you don't yet know. 
hours on, you have fought and lived and died with that character. And in the total darkness, after that last candle is snuffed out, the recordings play. I have had players cry, laugh, sit in stunned silence, cheer, all of the above. That moment of coming full circle, of hearing these then strangers tell their stories, has an extraordinary, cathartic, emotionally satisfying impact that I have never experienced in any other game. Not once have I seen it fail to catch players by surprise, even the ones who knew what was coming. It's a gut punch in the best way, and it lets everyone walk away from the gaming table with an oddly life-affirming sense of victory. Because why do we play horror games together if not to collectively explore our own tenacity and courage in the face of certain horrifying doom, and to know that our lives and choices, no matter how small in the grand scheme, matter. So, if that's what Ten Candles is, let's talk about what Ten Candles is not. Ten Candles is not a game that can be won in a traditional sense. Its focus is about storytelling and narrative. And beyond the contested roles, there are no mechanics for combat. It's not a game where optimization is key. As a GM, this is the game I run for groups when I have a player who, in other systems like D&D and Pathfinder, consistently leans exclusively into optimization. Ten Candles shatters expectations of how to engage with character and story, and shifts away from focusing so exclusively on what stats are on the page. This starts during character creation. Players write a virtue and vice on index cards. They then pass the virtue to their right and their vice to their left. For first-time players, this is often a shocking moment. The character they had been planning no longer exists, and they have to adjust to the traits that they are given. I've taken this idea and pulled it into one-shots with some of my D&D groups, where I wanted to either break some habits or spark some creativity. I have players write a class on one card and a background on the other, and then have them pass them to the person next to them. They then have to base their character on the cards that they have in front of them. It still allows for the freedom of subclass choice, but it also takes them into a new realm for building a backstory. Why was your warlock a sailor? Did something happen to them at sea to lead you down that path? The interconnectedness of the character design process is wonderful, and it, it builds relationships between the characters right away. Ten Candles is not a game with a set world. The book includes several modules that offer all sorts of concepts for story hooks and settings. It can be played as pulp horror with private eyes investigating them, or as a slasher at summer camp, even as a game in an all-dog world, which, side note, you should definitely run it by your players before using the dog module. People have very, very strong responses to the inevitable fates of their canine characters. While we're discussing talking to your players, Ten Candles is not a game for gotcha stories or gimmicks. Consent at the table is always important, but that importance is intensely elevated for horror games. I strongly recommend having a pregame conversation about boundaries, levels of gore and horror, and safety tools that you're going to use in your game. It's very important to, particularly with recent events in mind, to make sure that your players are fully aware that this game is tragic horror, and that their characters, and likely anyone else they come across, will not survive it. I highly recommend Kiana Shaw and Lauren Bryant Monk's Tabletop Safety Toolkit, which has a ton of resources for varying safety tools and techniques that you can use in your games. It's linked in the doobly-doo. I get to say that. <laughs> I generally run the game using lines and veils as well as an X card, but there are a huge number of tools available. The point of a horror game is to have fun, to be scared in a way that is enjoyable, and to terrorize your characters. It is never to actively try to play on your friends' fears, phobias, traumas, or discomfort. If someone is not having fun, it might be a good time to pause and figure out how to adjust. If you aren't sure how your players are responding to something, take a moment to check in with an is everyone okay with this? If you can trust one another to respect boundaries and to let each other know if something isn't comfortable, it provides the opportunity to really lean in on the dread and the terror of the scenario and collaboratively tell the kind of scary story that sends shivers up your spine. Ten Candles is full of incredible lessons for GMs and storytellers of all stripes. First and foremost among these, to me, is a masterclass in how to tell a horror story. Front and center, Ten Candles establishes an atmosphere that nearly imperceptibly intensifies as the story progresses, 
creeping in on the players. A steadily darkening game room that mirrors an increasingly claustrophobic game world, where creatures who hunt from the dark creep endlessly closer, does a substantial amount of mood building work for the GM. Not to mention that a table that looks set for a ritual and the recurring ceremonial nature of the repetition of the interstitial phrase creates a unique liminal space, one that feels set apart from the everyday and elevated into something not entirely of this world. The mechanical structure, too, emphasizes the way good horror should work. A slow, creeping build that accelerates into a harrowing chase and an inevitable climactic encounter with the terrifying entity that drives the story. You'll notice that I have not described them. Ten Candles emphasizes that there is no rush to deploy them in the story. They will always appear when the time is right, and they will always triumph in the end. But along the way, they, who will be unique to each session, based on the player and GM input, need to exert their influence. I've had them travel through the foundations of buildings, burrowing up through the feet of living things. I've had them be a hive mind, granting PCs telepathy as they are primed to be absorbed. They've been cultists and monsters and aliens. There are tips on how to run them, wonderful tips that are fantastic to pull into other games for other villains. Rather than engaging directly at first, they set traps and use illusions, destroy means of escape, and certainly decimate anything that offers light. The book also offers a tip to divide them into three subsets, proceeding from basic, easily vanquished minions, through commander-tier creatures who control the minion groups, all the way to one or two ultimate boss-like figures. Breaking down villains in these ways provides you with several options of different powers and abilities, tactics, and strengths. They, like the players, have a brink, which the GM may elect to burn if they are in a situation where it becomes necessary or advantageous to reveal themselves. I wanted to give a few tips for the game. First of all, buy your tea lights in bulk. It's never a bad idea to have extra candles around the house for emergencies or for jack-o'-lanterns or for emergency jack-o'-lanterns, but also once you start playing, you're going to want to have a kit ready. I keep mine in a box, so I'm ready to go. Also inside are my index cards, sharpies, a lighter, two distinctly different sets of dice, my voice recorder, and an old fashioned candle snuffer. Early on, I used to blow out the candles, but I found that the snuffer, which I bought for about $10, both adds to the ritual feel of the game and reduces the risk of accidentally extinguishing one of the other candles. I chose a voice recorder that gives off as little light as possible and that I can operate easily without looking. The final moments of the game are so crucial, so ensuring that you make them stick is key. Lights, extra sounds, fumbling with the recording all can disrupt that incredible moment of reflection and connection. Make it easy on yourself. If you use a phone, turn the brightness all the way down and practice operating it to make sure that you won't have issues finding the recording. Use a large bowl. I like using a glass or Pyrex bowl if possible for burning traits. The extra light refracting through the bowl makes for some beautiful ambiance. Keep water nearby, not just to extinguish the flames, but because often the cards will smoke for a while. Water is key. I tend to cut my cards in half or even quarters when I'm playing indoors. The smoke can set off smoke alarms, so minimizing it tends to be a good idea. If you're playing outside or in a place with good ventilation, use the full cards. Bask in the glow. I will occasionally use glow-in-the-dark dice in different colors or patterns for the conflict in the hope dice, but it's not at all necessary, and they rarely remain charged without a distracting light nearby. Beyond the basic structure, you have a ton of freedom to make it your own. You can easily adjust the physical elements for safety or accessibility. Battery-operated candles are great. Even a string of fairy lights could work. Just cover them up with something when you'd normally extinguish them. Tearing cards rather than burning them. Making video messages instead of audio recordings. Packing up and moving to a new station rather than blowing out a candle if you have a group that needs to move around as they play in order to keep focused. Adjusting lights and any sounds you might use for any sensory needs. I sometimes play a low, eerie sound that I increase as they approach. Just check in with your players and make sure everyone has the tools they need to enjoy the game. Ideally, this is a game played without interruption or outside distractions. In reality, most gaming tables need snacks, breaks, and opportunities to check in with family members and so forth. I recommend having an open table where people are free to get up, use the restroom, grab a snack, etc. as needed. But I request that if possible, everyone stays seated and focused for the last two or three scenes, which tend to move quickly. 
I also sometimes build in a break around the two hour mark. I mark the lit candles, I extinguish them while we take the break, and then I relight them once we return to resume play. That way no one loses time. This is a perfect game for returning to in-person gaming. It really connects people, and at least for me, is deeply life-affirming. Also, because it's so portable and there are no pieces to lose, it's a perfect game to play at a campsite or outside under the stars. If you have access to an interesting location, definitely take the opportunity to play there and create a module that fits the space. Any sounds or people walking by will just add to the mood and the atmosphere of the game. Use them to build out the dread of the story. Of everything I learned from Ten Candles, the thing that has stuck with me the most is how much of the narrative work I can entrust to my players. The book advises GMs to ask the players questions rather than give them answers, and that single tip has shifted so much of how I prepare and run games in any system now. In the same way that a monster is always scarier before it appears on screen, because every person projects their individual fears onto it, players project the things that matter to them onto the narrative when they're, when they're given the chance to do so. When you give the players control over the story, not just their characters, then suddenly they want to tell the best story, not just the one that makes their character look cool. The process of handing over narrative control, even down to something like beginning the game by asking, where are you? what's nearby, rather than describing a starting location, gets the players immediately engaged in building the world. The more they are connected to and involved in it, the more they care, the more the story matters, and the more impact the final scenes will have on them. And I have certainly found that those final moments, the moments where the characters finally lose their battle, are best when they can dictate their final stakes that are emotionally and narratively satisfying on a personal level. They know how their PC wants to go out. Let's say a player, when describing her character, mentions that she's wearing a locket. Asking questions like, where did you get the locket? Whose picture is in it? Not only allows the player to come up with backstory and develop a richer character, it provides you, as the GM, information that you can draw upon for moments in the future. Oh, your best friend gave it to you when you left for college, and it has a picture of you and your siblings? Great. Now you have a bunch of new characters, a best friend and siblings that can appear later in the game as NPCs. Speaking of NPCs, the Ten Candles character creation system, traits, moments, brinks, and some very simple descriptors, a name, a physical description, and a brief character concept, all of which can fit on a single index card, is a fantastic tool to carry into other game systems for NPC creation. You can even keep a file of different characters that have appeared in your games for future use in other stories. It's a fast, lightweight way to come up with memorable characters, and it makes things simple for when you need to invent new characters on the fly. Throughout the game, there have been opportunities for players to make a high-stakes choice, one with dire consequences, which, if failed, causes game-shifting results, or causes them to burn a trait or embrace a brink to try and achieve a goal. But in the end, they will always, always win. And allowing the players to describe their own ends is always a remarkable moment. Equally remarkable is watching the rest of the group, illuminated by that one small flickering candle as their allies fall away one by one until none are left and that last candle is extinguished. There is always silence. And now the words left incomplete hanging in the air. These things are true. The world is dark. And somehow, as their words from hours before echo in the silence, we, the players, are reinvigorated, reaffirmed in our existence. It's an extraordinary thing. And this is an extraordinary game. Ten Candles by Stephen Dewey is available through Cavalry Games, and you can follow Stephen's work on Twitter as at Shifty Ginger. The PDF is $10, but I recommend buying the book bundle, which is $28. My name is Jennifer Kretschmer. You can find me on Twitter as at DreamWisp or on Twitch as DreamWisp Jen. I love games and the stories we tell together playing them. And Ten Candles is one of the best I have ever played. They're getting close. We need to keep moving, so I'm going to end this here. But if you are watching this, know that we are still fighting, that we're trying, that we are giving it everything we have and we aren't giving up. I hope we all make it through. But ultimately, that's all we can know for sure, that we gave it our all. These things are true.
the world is dark and we are alive.